Okay, I think uh, two minutes are already passed. Um, and I'm really happy that so many people are interested into this talk today. So let, let us start. Uh, my name is Arena Heinzig, and I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, especially the participants, but also the speaker of today. Um, my role is, uh, in this case, uh, I'm the chair of the technical committee of GRSS, which is called REACT, and REACT stands for Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Te Technology. So it has a very long name, but it's everything that is related to using remote sensing and uh, to understand, or let me say, to improve our, our understanding uh, of climate change uh, issues. So that's the main idea of this technical committee. My personal background is I'm a geoscientist. And I'm very, um, and I'm uh, I'm I'm a researcher, let me say, at the German Aerospace Center, and uh, I'm also a professor at ETH Zurich. So, however, it's not about me today, but I'm very happy to have uh, today a very, uh, or glad I'm very uh, to have a speaker today, which is Andrea Donnellan uh, from um, from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She's a manager of the instrument system section of NASA, uh, JPL, and I'm happy that she will talk today about uh, a new proposal of a mission which is called surface topography in vegetation um, study. So I just pass now the word to Andrea. Thanks. Thanks, Irina. Irina. Good day, everybody. I can't say good morning because it's not morning for everybody, but good day. Um, I am the lead of NASA's study for surface topography and vegetation. I will give you background on that and also talk about the many other team members because I'm not the only person uh, involved in making this happen. And I'll talk about it in a min minute, but we're not yet as a mission or an observing system, but we're doing the maturation to get to that point. Um, this is an uh, image of our notional idea of what STV is. So STV is surface topography and vegetation. We, we don't envision a single platform. Um, often we launch a radar or an imaging spectrometer or, or some instrument. This we envision to be a constellation of instruments um, which fill in different gaps in the measurements that we need. So we envision orbiters with light, LIDAR, radar, and stereo imaging, but also high altitude platforms and aircraft. Um, so the background on this comes from the Decadal Survey. Uh, the Decadal Survey takes place about every 10 years. It's run by the National Research Council and the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine. Um, they generate recommendations from the environmental monitoring and earth science and applications communities. So they're recommending an integrated and sustainable approach to the conduct of the U.S. government civilian space-based earth system science programs. So I often think of it largely as a NASA study, but it's not. It's the committee works with NASA, NOAA, and the U.S. Geological Survey to understand the agency expectations, what budget allocations they might expect, and then design the recommendations based within that, those expectations. The decadal survey was designed, um, was divided into several science disciplines. Uh, th those were solid earth ecosystems, climate, hydrology, and weather. I'll talk about how we changed that slightly for our study. And then um, the link is at the bottom. If you Google decadal survey, you can find it and you can download it if you um, add your email address. In the decadal survey, they recommended surface topography and vegetation as a targeted observable. They recommended designated observables, which were measurement types or observation types, which were ready for implementation now. One of those is SBG or surface biology and geology mission, which is a pair of imaging spectrometers and visible and thermal infrared wavelengths. Surface topography and vegetation is harder. The technologies aren't as mature. So that's why they, de they defined it as a targeted observable. And the goal of STV is to produce high resolution global topography, including bare surface land topography, ice topography, vegetation structure, and shallow water bathymetry. The candidate measurement approaches that they recommended were radar or LIDAR. We have since added stereo imaging into that mix in our study. I show you how we changed a little bit the breakdown of the science disciplines. Um, we took the 
five that they had and changed them to map better to STV, those are solid earth, vegetation structure, cryosphere, hydrology, and coastal geomorphology. And as you can imagine, as our coasts are changing rapidly, we need good measurements of topography. Then they recommended STV for incubation. So NASA took that and I'm going to minimize you, Arena, so I, I can't actually see if you gesture to me. Um, it, the incubation study is managed by NASA's Earth Science and Technology Office, and it runs in partnership with NASA's research and analysis. So we as team leads and team members work closely with them. There are a mix of activity and the team continues to grow. There's technology development, modeling, system design and analysis, and then small scale pilot demonstrations. So again, the decadal survey recommended a new program element called incubation. It was intended to accelerate the readiness of high priority observables, but those that are not yet feasible for cost effective flight implementation. So our goal is to mature it to the point that the next dec decadal survey can recommend it as a designated observable. So right now, STV is neither a mission or an observing system. It's a study to get us to that point. It's not a designated observable study either. Um, but again, we want to get to that point. And this incubation study is focused on state-of-the-art evaluation, identification of gaps and needed investments, and then preliminary requirements refinement or needs, because contractually requirements mean something within NASA. We did a study in 2020. Um, we were selected in 20, late 2019 and 2020, uh, just as the pandemic was happening. We, um, we were set for our first in-person meeting the week that the world shut down. So all of that entire study was done virtually. Um, it worked out kind of well because we met every week as a result. And I think we kept a really good pace and good progress. And we produced this paper, which you can find, or study report, which you can find it um, up here at the link. Just Google NASA Decadal STV, and you can find this report. And I thought that found that laid a very good foundation for the rest, the continuing study. One of the things we had to do was take those five different science disciplines plus the applications community and get us all marching in the same direction, so that we could have something that was implementable for the entire community. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Our study objectives then are to develop STV science and architecture as input to the next Earth Science Decadal Survey. And I will say now that that first study was a year long to produce this study report. The current study is to do the actual maturation of the technology and the science and, and put this observing system concept together. So we wanna develop the science and architecture, as I said, as input to the next decadal survey. NASA advance, is advancing PI-led research projects. So unlike the last study where our entire focus was on producing this study report, we're also doing research to mature various components of STV. In that, since then we're developing roles and responsibilities for the team members to mature STV, and I'll show you that in a minute. We're working to coordinate our STV projects and by doing so, then we can find out where the gaps are and where future um, future investments should be made. We're identifying needed observing system simulation experiments, which are also known as OSSEs, uh, study areas, campaigns, and additional gaps. We're working to leverage existing data, missions, and activities, and I'm really happy to participate here and to work with ARENA because the global community has a lot they can offer, and if we can coordinate it, we'll have a much stronger observing system. And we wanna build an STV community, so we're doing that here. If you go to the STV webpage, again, you can just Google NASA Decadal Survey STV, you'll find that easily. There is a form you can sign up to get onto our community email list. And our emails are pretty infrequent. They're on the order of, you know, if we're having a meeting, they're more frequent, but otherwise they're updates every few months. We've worked very hard in the last year to develop STV questions because STV is really in the end science driven. And so we need to um, we need to make sure we're answering science questions. So our overarching question is how does earth changing surface structure inform us about climate change, natural hazards, ecosystems, and water availability? And the way we view it is 
this information is written in the landscapes. So our questions are, um, for solid earth, how does earth's surface structure respond to tectonic and climate forces and what are the implications for geologic hazards? And you'll see threaded throughout here, the react theme and the tie to climate and technologies. For vegetation structure, we're looking at how is Earth's vegetation responding to climate change and what are the feedbacks to the carbon cycle, hydrologic cycle, and e ecosystems. For cryosphere, we want to understand how are the ice sheets, how are the changing ice sheets and glaciers interacting with the global climate system and Earth's oceans. And NASA and European and other communities have done an excellent job doing ice altimetry. But now we want to increase the resolution of our measurements so we can look at the margins and look at the glaciers and look at these rapidly changing fine scale processes. For hydrology, we ask how will water availability and flow change with climate and increasingly dynamic landscapes? Again, there's a definitely a climate theme in there. As well as coastal geomorphology, how are coasts changing by natural and human influences and what are the impacts? I live in California. And there's a famous highway, Highway Run, one that runs down the coast of California that is often having landslides and getting um, damaged by these landslides or par parts of it taken out and they have to keep repairing it. So that to me is a real world application that's local. And then we have applications. How does understanding changing topography and vegetation structure enable better hazard and resource management? And that piece is very important, both to NASA and the community. Here are science groups. I'm not gonna read every one of these, but again, I mentioned we have solid earth, vegetation structure, cryosphere, hydrology, and coastal, coastal geomorphology. Underpinning all of that then are applications in each of these areas. Um, and then for the applications that were missed in these bins in our study report, we called out additional applications that could be addressed by STV. But again, these themes are similar to what we have in the questions, um, climate, natural hazards, um, glacial changes, lake and reservoir changes, um, et cetera. We're also divided into technology groups. Uh, the main technologies, again, called out by the decadal survey were LIDAR and radar, but we've added stereo imaging. As you can imagine, that's, that's an excellent way to recover topography. And then we have the Aussies. And an Aussie, an observing system simulation experiment is an end-to-end performance of the instrument um, tied to the measurements that we're trying to make. So we wanna simulate that in order to properly design our mission. Overarching all of this, then we need an architecture to tie these different technologies together. And I will just say that radar, LIDAR, and stereo imaging all have different orbit requirements. So right there, that drives us towards multiple assets in our constellation, our observing system constellation. And then we have platforms, and by platforms, I mean anything from high altitude down to drones, aircraft in the middle, and we have to fuse the data, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's a big effort in this project. Here are study leads. You can see we have a big team. These are just the leads. Um, so there are about 50 people on the team, and there are over 700 people that make up the community right now. I'm the lead. I was the lead for the last study in this one. Dave Harding was the lead from NASA Goddard for the last study, the technology co-lead. And Craig Glenny from University of Houston is currently the technology co-lead. He's the director of the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping. For solid earth, um, we have Paul Lundgren from JPL. He studies largely volcanoes using topography. Brooke Medley leads the cryosphere group from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Sasan Sachi leads the vegetation structure group, Mark Samard, the hydrology group, and Lori Magruder, the coastal geomorphology group, which includes shallow water bathymetry. That's a gap where we don't have measurements. The ships can go out deep to do bathymetry, but can't get near shore to do the shallow water bathymetry. Yunling Liu from JPL runs the radar group, Ben Smith from University of Washington, the LIDAR group, Mel Rogers, the stereo imaging group, along with Curtis Paget at JPL because she's been out for a little bit on leave. We added recently a data fusion group that's co-led by David Sheen from University of Washington and he fuses LIDAR and stereo imaging primarily. And it's co-led by Robert Truhaft who fuses largely radar and LIDAR. So we have the, 
the three then that will work together to fuse. Again, these group leads are guiding the community and guiding the, the team. They're not doing all the work themselves. For architecture, we have Mark Steffen from Goddard Space Flight Center and Joe Green from JPL. Platforms is Matt Flatelin from NASA Ames. He has a broad knowledge on um, various platforms up to high altitude to all the airplanes in the NASA fleet and other commercial assets. And the observing system simulation experiments is run by Marco Lavelle from JPL. Uh, we've expanded our applications group because we have uh, both partners and end users. So Pietro Malello is working more in the collaborations. He's He's got good outreach into the commercial sector as well as the international sector. And then Rob Zinke is looking at the application sort of downward into the application. So it's how do we partner and how do we serve um, the applications communities? And team members participate in one or more of these groups. These groups meet regularly. We'll be having a team meeting in June, and then there will be another community meeting in October on the East Coast. These are the app, STV science and application main measurements. Um, bare surface topography, you can see here a, a notional fault that we can measure with topography. We need to remove the vegetation, and that's a challenge that hasn't been addressed that well by the community. So if I go down to the left, we have vegetation structure, and as that changes over time or changes in different environments, we can look at ecosystem habitats, we can look at biomass and carbon cycle and all kinds of things. That's a very important signal, but needs to remo be removed for the solid earth scientists. Then we have ice topography, and I mentioned a little bit before, it's very complex. The ice sheets are thinning. Glaciers are moving rapidly um, and declining. We have sea ice um, and, and calving glaciers, et cetera. And then shallow water bathymetry, we can look at shorts on uh, faults underground. We can look at vegetation under underwater, not underground, excuse me, underwater, and look at the ocean coastal interface there. Also, we can look at rivers and lakes. And then I put right in the middle of this um, plus change because we're mostly scientists. We wanna know how things are changing over time. We wanna understand the underlying processes. So we're not just looking at a single snapshot in time of topography, but that change as well, which you can think right offhand is relevant to glaciers, volcanoes, faults, um, coastal processes, and, and vegetation changing over time. So our big measurement challenge is how do we separate the vegetation from the bare earth topography? And that's why we established that data fusion group to work on that because I'll, I'll get to a minute, but um, these are the main measurements we want. Each of those different technologies address well different pieces of these measurements we wanna make here. So we have a digital surface model, that's the green line in the top plot that just tells us the overlying envelope of structure on the earth. Um, then we have the vegetation in between, which we want to remove. Radar to first order is very good at estimating vegetation structure. Stereo imaging and LIDAR are good at estimating the surface. And then if we flatten the earth, uh, we can get the canopy height model. Or if we take out the vegetation, we get the digital terrain model, which is the red line. So those are the main measurements we wanna make. LIDAR is good at finding the top of the canopy in the ground. Did, uh, stereo imaging is wider field of view and high resolution. And then again, the radar is good at the vegetation structure. Again, this is just a first order. We wanna combine all these into a single product or three single products. This is a little data to wisdom pyramid. Um, starting at the bottom, we have the data. That's the foundation to STV. We want multi-view time series. We have images we can con convert into stereo images, LIDAR returns we can convert into point clouds, and then radar returns we can get the, the topography as well as the vegetation structure. Then we want systematic products over the, out of that. That's the information. The main ones I mentioned before, the digital surface model, the digital terrain model, and the canopy height model. We also want to know snow depth, sea ice freeboard, the vegetation structure and the shallow water bathymetry. That then we translate into knowledge, our process understanding. How does that, what does that tell us about natural hazard, climate impacts and ecological systems? 
And then we want to go to wisdom and, and take action. And that's where committees like React are very good at providing a transition into that action uh, where we need to worry about stewardship of our earth, the global health, adaptation, assessment and response to natural hazards, and then mitigation recovery to um, those natural disasters and natural hazards. Just wanted to show a few examples then. Bare Earth highlights geophysical processes um, and allows us to determine uh, improved determination of overlying vegetation structures. So on the left, we have Incline Village. And uh, on the left, uh, through the image, you can see topographic gradients that would imply there's a fault. But we have the trees and we have the built environment. And so it's a little bit murky in that view. On the right, the built environment and the vegetation structure, vegetation has been removed. And you can see the Incline Village Fault very well. This is on the north shore of Lake Tahoe in California, right? Uh, this part's actually in Nevada. It's right on the corner between the two. And as a, we use this in our study, it came out of an earlier paper. We use this in the first year study, but our first team meeting was in Incline Village. So we were able to go visit this fault and see what it looks like on the ground. And here it is, um, it's a little shallow swell hard to see. You could map it and say, oh, there may be a fault here, but it's very obvious in the rem remote sensing in the stereo image or the, the image from the LIDAR. Um, you see the trees there, that fence is there because there was an elementary school built right on the fault and it, it can no longer operate. So it's fenced in and not, not being used. But uh, for me as a geophysicist, I like getting back and getting a broad view. And then you can go down and target where you want to look as we see here. Shallow water bathymetry, as I mentioned, is a data gap. Uh, that's because the ships can do bathymetry offshore where it's deeper, but they have a tr trouble getting in closer. So we're looking at techniques like uh, stereo imaging where you can see through the water or LIDAR where we know we're getting returns from uh, emissions like ISAT at the water so that we can start to measure the shallow water bathymetry, look for faults, look for ecosystem processes or understand those better. These are the observables that we want We want to do. We need a global baseline map, and we're still working on what resolution we want for that. Submeter would be great, but maybe five meter first. I'm looking at this as an evolving observing system. So as capability improves, we can launch new assets, but we want to start um, now with or soon with, with measurements we can make and return valuable data. So we want a global baseline topography net map, then you can go back and measure change. For surface topography, we're interested in the active tectonics areas, as well as um, those include volcanoes, et cetera. So that's the purple or the pink in the middle. Vegetation structure, the arid regions aren't as important, but we wanna look at um, the vegetated area on the globe. We can also do things with sand dunes. So we, at least from our, um, baseline map, we can study sand dunes and then maybe target them in time to see how they move. Shallow water bathymetry, I mentioned, we don't want to do just ocean measurements, but also rivers and lakes. And that's why you see a lot of red lines or red spots across the globe in the map. And then we want to do snow depth as well as cryosphere. So that um, shows the area where we get snow globally. Uh, in the first community, we ranked our needs by important. We had different surveys of the, in our first study, I should say, we had different surveys of the community and we all looked through our report to figure out what was important. Um, so these were the needs ranked by importance from the community. Spatial coverage was most important. We need global measurement of topography. We want high horizontal resolution. We want um, high repeat frequency. And this part kept coming out again and again and again, because as scientists, we need repeated measurements so that we can study change over time. And then vertical resolution was important. And these other things, point density, rate of change, accuracy, geolocation for doing science, um, maximum water depth, and then slope accuracy and latency. So for response, we need low latency me measurements. As I mentioned earlier, in the first study, we had five different disciplines and we have it now, but we're working, we now know each other. The first study, we took these different communities, these five science needs and applications and the radar, LIDAR and stereo imaging communities. And we 
were able to converge on a set of measurements that would fit most of the needs of each of those communities. So I thought that was a big, um, big achievement from that first study. Uh, so we had aspirational and threshold needs, and then we looked at the median need as well as the most stringent need. So the each team, each subgroup put together a, a long traceability matrix of what they needed, and then we can consolidated that into this table. So we want, um, if we look at the the left side, the aspirational, I like to say that's the more expensive observing system and the threshold is the less observing, less expensive observing system. And we may move from threshold to aspirational over time if we can have an evolving system. So we'd like 90% of the globe mapped with a five day latency because we want to respond to disasters. And even for science, that's important because things change rapidly after events occur. Uh, we'd like it to run for three to nine years, uh, uh, weekly to seasonal, at least, uh, repeat frequency, Hor res horizontal resolution of one meter, preferably. Um, we could go up to 20 meters. Vertical accuracy of 20 centimeters to 50 centimeters. Vertical veg vegetation vertical resolution of one to two meters. Bathymetry max depth in the order of 10 to 25 meters. So again, it's very shallow water bathymetry. Our geolocation accuracy, we need well in one to five meter range. And then our rate of change accuracy, five to 35 centimeters per year. But this set of project meets many of the science and applications needs um, for the community. As I mentioned, we have STV community and team meetings. Uh, the next community meeting will be in October on the East Coast, somewhere probably in Maryland, possibly Virginia. But the goal of these meetings, um, here's the meeting that we had in October and people that turned on their camera then, um, we put those in as well because the meetings are hybrid these days. I, I love in person, but hybrid gets a lot more points of view. And Arena spoke at our workshop or our, our meeting, which we appreciated. Uh, so we're looking at the science, the compelling questions and objectives, the justification of the science needs and the improvement of understanding our science needs, data fusion and separating vegetation and ground, uh, and planning of joint experiments. For technology, we need to flow the science needs to the capabilities. So I would say in this year two of our study, that's one of the primary goals that we have. We need to mature the technologies as needed and advance our processing capability. There's a lot of data in, in producing topography. Then we also need to look at the architecture. We need to bind this all together with coverage, resolution, latency, performance modeling of the instruments, looking at airborne and spaceborne capabilities and developing a concept of operations. Here's some of the findings from the workshop. For the science and applications, we wanna at least early on and emphasize the global baseline topography map and then the science that can be accomplished with just a snapshot in time of topography. We want to understand where targeted repeat and high resolution measurements are needed. We need to develop clear traceability from science objectives to observables and physical parameters. Did you have a question, Arena? No, okay. Um, Collect uniform contemporaneous data in joint experiments, and we're working towards that, hopefully with our first experiment in August, which will be an airborne experiment. Then we need to catalog the existing data. You know, uh, DLR has had Tandem X and other, uh, other missions. There are um, stereo images from, from Maxar now. So there's a lot of data out there that we need to understand. Um, we need to conduct airborne campaigns, again, to get these contemporaneous joint data. We need to develop processing and analysis, data fusion and classification. Our observing system simulation experiments, we wanna find surrogate data that we can use to simulate spaceborne instruments. And we need to look at instrument observing system performance and also the gaps that we have. Our technology is a target TRL of five by 2027, so a, a almost operational capability. And then we need to map the technology capability to measurement capability. 
And all this, again, is bound together by an architecture. We need to conduct the airborne campaigns and develop a concept of operations. Now I'll just take you through a little bit of the science and data that we have um, to show you. This is an airborne stereo imaging project that I lead as a component of STV. On the bottom of this Gulfstream 5 aircraft, you see the uh, UAV SAR radar which we fly jointly with. We have side looking cameras that look the same direction as the radar, as well as cameras looking down the Nader port. So here's our instrument upside down in the upper right corner. Um, it's eight cameras, high resolution cameras. They look down through a Nader port. That's, our, um, that's us on the airplane with our rack, with our equipment on the left side. Uh, the instrument flies at 12 and a half kilometers. We can fly lower. But at 12 and a half kilometers, and we designed that to fly with UAV SAR, we look forward and, and backward 11 degrees, and we have a 12 kilometer wide swath. A six hour flight can cover 2,500 kilometers with that 12 kilometer wide swath, produces about nine terabytes of data. So there's a lot of data that we have to process. We can fly lower. We're now um, accommodating that instrument on a King Air so that we can fly lower and we'll get narrower swath, but higher resolution. Just wanted to show some example products. On the upper left is Painted Canyon, um, or the left side is Painted Canyon, what it looks like from the air from a QUAKES product. And QUAKE stands for Quantifying Uncertainty in Kinematics of Earth Systems. Uh, the star down there shows where it is in California on the West Coast. This part of Painted Canyon and the San Andreas Fault is at the southern end of the San Andreas Fault. And you can see that you have these sort of Two faults, um, they're in the sand, you can't see it in this image, but they're cracks forming all the time. The fault creeps a little bit continuously. On the right side is near Death Valley. It's one valley over from Death Valley. And I was looking at this image and I saw this black thing where the arrow's pointing and the inset. And I didn't know what it was, but then as soon as I was able to rotate the image, because we have a 3D image, you see it's a big fault, a big tear in the ground. And it has 140 meters of throw on it. So this is part of the basin range province that's expanding. So being able to rotate the images helps a lot um, and see them in 3D. And then down on the bottom, there was a rupture in 1872, a magnitude seven plus earthquake. You still see that fault scarp um, in the image. You can also see the Owens River and you can see the California aqueduct or the Los Angeles aqueduct on the right. These, this is one of our early test flights, so the images are a little bit green. We've done better more recently. Here's Mammoth Mountain. Um, it's in California, south of Lake Tahoe. It's a, a large ski area, so here you see these ski slopes. We, originally, we had some challenges processing the snow, but we've improved that. Again, on the right is the camera housed, um, looking down through the Nader port and what it looks like at the bottom before it was covered. Um, so you can see the one kilometer scale there. We're looking south, or south is up because our brains work better when shadowing comes from the top. So it's always funny to look at things with, with north up. Um, but you can see we can make out individual trees from this. And if I do a, a LIDAR comparison with this in the lake space, and so if I move up back here, I'm now looking in this area up here, I should probably put a little inset. We have the quakes image and we have a LIDAR image and we do differencing between these two. You can see that we do quite well within plus or minus two meters. Um, vertical, we do a little bit worse up here. Generally, we do uh, within two meters. If we look at the oblique view, though, it's easy to tell where our difference is. And it's on this, this sandy cliff here, the, the sand at the base of this cliff. We're not actually sure yet if our discrepancy or the inaccuracy is coming from the stereo imaging or the LIDAR or both. But again, being able to look at this obliquely helps a lot to understand where the differences are. But generally, Quakes is performing quite well. If we look at these images, these are images collected in 2021 and then 2022. You can see we've improved our processing. The trees are more rounded in 2021. 2022, they're sharper. You can make out the individual trees. Again, this is from 12 and a half kilometers altitude or 41,000 feet. And if we do differencing, we have differences where the shadows are, but do fairly well. And then I went out and measured the trees in the field. The white is the 2021 results. The yellow is the 2022 results. And then the, the bold yellow is the ground truth. 
we almost never measure the top of the canopy and that's because the canopy narrows below the resolution of the measurement. But you can see that it's pretty easy to go out in the field and calibrate if you have uniform tree stands to, to calibrate the actual height. And over here, here's a glacial erratic. Um, we do pretty well. So it's only about two pixels and yet we can pick out the height of that pretty well using the stereo imaging. This is just to blow up and show you what the trees look like. They're a little bit fuzzy, but you can make out individual trees in this point cloud. And then of course the challenge is removing those trees so that we have the bare earth topography as well. Here we've removed the vegetation. So we've classified the vegetation. Here's our complete point cloud. Um, if we take out the vegetation, you have ground only. You can also plot just the vegetation only. And then I did a difference of those two. And I thought it was very interesting. Again, up here, you can see the ski area quite well. It's above tree line. So there's zero meter vertical difference because there's no trees there. Out here is scrub. In here, you can measure the highest trees. They're about 45 meters high. Again, you'd want to calibrate that to know the actual top of the trees. And then down here is a fire scar from 1992. This area never recovered from that fire. It's surveyed decadally. Um, when the trees do grow back, there tend to be big blowdown events. So it just hasn't recovered and it pops up really well in this image. Then I wanted to show features at different resolution. This is some of the simulations we're doing or uh, not simulations because it's real data. We have SRTM or other data over here at 30 meter sampling. And then we have one meter data over here, largely from LIDAR. Um, and you can see how the resolution of the images degrades. Um, I mean, how your ability to resolve features in the images degrades as the resolution degrades. So this is just the beginning of some of these studies. This is our STB roadmap, and I kind of turn it into a little bit of a Gantt chart of where we are right now. Um, but we need to do our geophysical process modeling, our simulation experiments, um, new observing system design strategies, mature the sensor and platforms, conduct in situ and airborne campaigns. We need to reduce the size mass weight of the sensors. Uh, data fusion is a big thing we need to work on, change detection al algorithms, our architectures trade studies. Eventually we wanna look at onboard processing to reduce our data volumes, do smart tasking to respond to events, and then quantify the uncertainty of our instrument. But we were, we're really looking at this um, new observing strategy with multi-source measurements. So just to summarize, Here's our, our concept of this multi-source um, observing system. An orbital observing system can meet a set of STC science and applications needs serving all of the STV disciplines. An architecture of multiple platforms and sensors on orbital and suborbital assets would address STV needs more thoroughly. And I think that's very important to note. All the science and applications disciplines need different accurate repeat measurements to measure temporal changes, but we can bring those together into one observing system. Oops, we had that STV workshop. A global baseline topography map and overlying vegetation structure is needed followed by targeted repeat measurements. We had our STV community workshop November 14th to 15th, and I'll be posting those findings. We finalize those. We need to get them posted and sent out to the community very soon. With that, I will stop. And should I go off? The presentation so we can see better, Arena, or stay on the presentation? I think you, you can stay on the presentation in the moment. Yes, thanks a lot first, uh, Andrea, for this uh, very complete overview uh, of these kind of planned activities. Uh, I understand it's not really a mission still, but uh, hopefully soon it will be a mission. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my question is, is there some, some questions from the audience? Now, I'm just checking the chat. I haven't seen up to now something. So if you like, and if you have questions, please post them into the chat or even uh, in the FN, FN, uh, FN, FN, FNA, so FNQ, let me say, um, Q&A, sorry, um, uh, chat, because for me, it's written in German here, sorry. <laughs> uh, so Q&A, that's the same. So we have a um, special Q&A chat. Uh, if you like, you can also post it in. So I can start with a, 
with a question, with, uh, if that's fine. So I, I found this is a very important uh, study, I have to say, because what is really missing is something that is describing bare surfaces. This is what in the moment from, let me say, from remote sensing uh, instrument is still not available. And I found it very challenging also to do it, even though we're doing it this with different instruments or try to do it with different instruments. My question a little bit is to you, what do you think, how challenging is it? Because if I'm looking also to the uh, requirements that different uh, application have, also the requirements are very challenging. So I was reading something between 20 and 50 centimeter of accu vertical accuracies which I think, wow, that's probably very difficult to receive it uh, worldwide. So my question is probably a little bit, what do you think, how realistic and um, feasible is such uh, to, to comply to these requirements, like, let me say, with this, with this kind of mission? Well, there are needs now because we don't have requirements because we're not a mission yet. But um, okay. uh, <laughs> I keep getting corrected. <laughs> Uh, no, it's very difficult. And that's why I view this as a sort of plug and play as, as capability increases, we add new assets. From what we heard at the workshop or the meeting in November, five meter global topography would be very helpful. And I think as a geophysicist, bare earth topography would be very helpful, even at five meters. If you looked at the degrading resolution plot, you could still make out a lot of features, even at much lower resolution. So I, we need to consider that carefully. I think we will get there eventually. Um, we're going to be able to handle the data volumes as well as just the technology of, of observing these. Um, and it is very hard, as you know, to separate the vegetation from the bare earth. So that's one of our big focuses right now. Mm -hmm. and, um, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I would agree probably... Uh, Reducing a little bit the spatial resolution helps in this case, potentially, I, I would agree on this. Um, but then the next challenge probably is also because you like to do it from different instruments, right? You like to combine radar with LIDAR. Is there already a concept how you like to approach it or which kind of methodology is behind? Is there something? So the first order and this actually, there's a question that is similar. So I'll answer okay. if you're asking it. Um, Someone asked about separating vegetation for bare ground. Can we apply high resolution SAR images as well as LIDAR data? Um, yes, uh, we're working on developing that right now. To first order, I think you wanna find the top of the canopy and find the ground returns where you can. Use the radar for the vegetation structure doing TOMO SAR and then remove that so you have the bare earth topography and then a. So that's the general algorithms. I, I don't have specific ones I'm gonna go over right now. But then you need to validate and verify those measurements. So we need a airborne campaigns and ground campaigns, ground field measurements to really understand that we're doing that correctly. Um, and again, I don't see how we can do this without all three measurements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's probably very difficult because each of these instruments has a specific capability, right, which which can be used in can in, in combination much better as uh, having it separately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there, there's also two other questions in the normal chat. So the, what, the first one is, what are the change detection algorithms that we can use? Um, I have been, so there's iterative closest point and things like that. I've been using Cloud Compare for my work. They're tools that open topography is put together. So I'm not developing all these algorithms. I'm more a user. Those are what I'm using right now. Um, there I've also used, or somebody has done for me a JPL, their change detection algorithm, but I don't know exactly what their math is behind it. Mm -hmm. I, I will say maybe related to this, and I should have put it in the slides. There is a special topical collection uh, for American Geophysical Union Right now it's earth and space science. And then we want to also bring in JGR, Journal of Geophysical Research, as well as GRL, Geophysical Research Letters, so that we can have a collection in one place, a, re a repository of these algorithms people would publish in their science results, et cetera. So look for that. I will announce that through the, um, through the community email list. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's also another question uh, about collaboration. Uh, there's somebody, somebody is writing, it's very interesting what you presented and is there a potential or possibility for collaboration for the project? Uh, definitely. I would say a good place to start is get on the community email list. Um, look, look at the leads and see if you can work with them on your specific area of interest. Come to the te the the community meetings either in person or virtually, and start to connect to people. NASA will have calls. You know, for the U.S. people, I don't know how international they are, but there will be various calls to mature these different components. So that those are the best ways to get involved. Um, and then the same person is also asking about uh, fusion models. Um, in the fusion model, what automatic reg registration process has been considered? So we're, I was, I was going to say, we're not quite there yet. I would look for some of the work by David Sheen and Robert Truhaft that are leading this. But again, we're at the very baby stages where at the last month we were just starting to do the high level vision of what we want to do. And then we need to drill down and view, view the fusion. So I'd say come back in three years, we'll have better <laughs> answers. But this is a great place in, for people to get involved um, mm -hmm. point in time. And as for the email address, I would say go to the STV webpage and fill out the form to get on that community email list. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is what is the status uh, or milestones of the STV? Well, I showed that um, that kind of milestone plot. So the status is we're still in incubation phase. We, I would say actually in a few years, we could probably be ready to launch something. That doesn't mean NASA will be ready for us to launch it, but have enough of a concept and have the technology uh, mature enough that we can launch things. I mean, LIDAR is all already flying as ISAT and Tandem X is already flying and Maxar, you know, is already doing stereo. So yeah, a few years, three to five years, somebody asks, yes, we, because of the NASA process, we need to become adopted by the decadal survey to be recommended for NASA. So that's more like a 10 year process for implementation. The way I like to say it is we're one decadal survey behind surface biology and geology, SBG, which is currently in implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually, again, this was a question three to five years. Yes, I, I think this, this is something that you can uh, confirm here. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, pro pro probably we will get an, another, let me say, presentation then and latest, let me say, in five years to see what other progress made in this respect. Uh, okay, there's somebody's asking also if there's a possibility to get a PDF of the lecture. I think what we what we are doing this is a recording of uh, the webinar, so this webinar will be available on YouTube uh, later on on the GRSS channel. So please have a look there. Uh, um, all the recordings and also all the webinars are on this YouTube channel. So please have a look there. It's, uh, it's very interesting also to look to, to other ones. Um, yes, so from my point, I do not have any question anymore, but I'm not sure if somebody else has some questions still. Um, I think not uh, at the end. So then... I, I just want to mention too, the PDF of the lecture. I... At some point, we will probably make a cleaner summary slide set and we'll post them on the STV page, but also look in the literature because mm -hmm. we just opened this special collection and we will have summary papers and detailed papers in there. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, IGARS, that's good to know. There's mm -hmm. a session at IGARS also on STV. So for those great. going to IGARS, join us there. Yeah, that's great. That's a good announcement. So please <laughs> register for IGERS, right? <laughs> so that you know more about uh, this mission and also other missions and projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would say then from this point of view, we could close now the session here. So thanks again for the audience uh, being so active and asking questions and being with us today here. And I really like to thank Andrea very much for this very great overview and uh, which was very informative so i really liked it thanks a lot and i have pushed the fingers that it will help right yeah, <laughs> to go you. to the next stage stage let me say uh, to realize it 
in 10 years, at least to, to have now more updates in five years later, this would be yes. great. And maybe we'll have some components, who knows? I'm always optimistic, so. That's right. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks for the audience. And I wish you still a nice day or good morning or a nice evening. <laughs> I'll have my coffee. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.